golf coach here at North Greenville. I've only been here for about three months, which is a long story all in itself. I mean, I could spend the whole hour and whatever talking about how I got here and how the good Lord actually put me in a place that you would have just told me four months ago that I would be. I'd say you're out of your mind because I didn't, I, it just wasn't supposed to be, I didn't think. Um, some things that, um, you know, I've been asked to talk about, it, it's hard to just jump straight into a coaching career without talking about your life first, what, what led you to where you're at. Um, when I was in junior high, I started kind of like tutoring other kids my age or even a little bit younger, and that lasted throughout high school. I, I found out very quickly I actually enjoyed working with others as far as teaching goes and, and, and helping others and mentoring others or whatever you want to call it, right? And when I got into my high school years, I found out that athletes have an opportunity to work with like little junior players when it comes to golf. So I was doing things like working um, the first tee and you know other junior clinics and stuff at all the local golf courses around where I was from. And, and where I was from is like right in the kind of southeastern part of Ohio and West Virginia, right where West Virginia and Ohio kind of meet, except for the only thing that separates them is the Ohio River. So I spent half the time, you know, in Ohio, half the time in West Virginia, but it was all just the same area. So I got to make a name for myself in that area before I was even out of high school because I was always working the junior clinics. I was always trying to help do anything I could, which gives you experience, which gives you, you know, the, the stuff that you need in order to go to the next level. Um, after you know, a few years, I was about 23, I became an actual um, teaching professional. So, you know, getting actually paid for teaching golf, okay, and, 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 you know, making appointments and so forth, which was really cool. And then I went off, I played five years on the South Florida mini tour, spent some time playing, you know, golf professionally, came back to where I was from, and opened up a pro shop, still started, you know, kind of getting more into teaching, more into teaching. And one of the things that we would do at the club that I was at was host a very large NCAA Division II golf tournament, 32 teams. It was actually a double shotgun. We'd sh shotgun at 8 a.m., we'd shotgun at 1, 1, 1 p.m. So it was one of the largest ones that you could find. So we would have D2 schools from everywhere. Well, the local college that was actually the host I got to be pretty good friends with their AD, their golf coach, and whatnot. I did that for another five years, and then I thought to myself, you know what? I want to really get into teaching because I would like to be a coach. I didn't have an education um, uh, degree, so I started looking locally for something that would help me out in that capacity. Um, I went to the school that had hosted that golf tournament, it was called Ohio Valley University. And while I was there, I found out how expensive it was to actually go back to school. And I thought, mm, well, good Lord doesn't want me to do this because I don't have that kind of jingle in my jangle. Right? You know, just <laughs> not gonna happen. I was out with leaving campus. I ran into the athletic director and he says, what are you doing here? I explained to him my little situation. He says, I can help you. He goes, how would you like a free education? I went. Yeah, right. How are you going to do that? He said, well, the golf coach actually just resigned. He said, we're looking for a new golf coach. He said, I won't even have to interview anybody if you're interested. We'll give you, you can take classes for free and stuff and be the golf coach. I was like, so? I mean, it was like, it just fell right in my lap. It was unbelievable. Um, so I, I finished my education um, degree in secondary so social studies and I decided to go on and get my master's degree in education while I was at it. So, you know, I was able to get all of that without paying anything for it, which was crazy to me. And, and in the meantime, we built a pretty good program where I was at. We were putting a lot of trophies in the trophy case. So we were starting to get a good name for ourselves. We were actually the smallest Division II school in the nation. We only had 450 students at the entire college. Um, and, you know, it was, it was fun. The school had made a decision just prior to 2019 to change a lot of things. They borrowed a bunch of money to um, redesign.
design some things, some build some new buildings. They changed their logo. They changed their school colors. They did not realize how much that would cost to do something like that. And they went really far in debt. And guess what happened? COVID hit. And 85% of OVU's student population were student athletes. Where do you think those student athletes went when NCAA says, hey, no more sports? They went home. I'm not paying to go to school for no reason. Like, I'm not going to get the players. I can go to a community college and play a third of what I'm going to pay here. So anyway, um, the school ended up being a, a, a COVID casualty and shut completely down. We were told in December of last year um, on a Tuesday that the following Friday, when everybody goes home for break, that's it. We're all done. You don't have jobs. Now, you know, devastating I mean, for everybody. I had to find homes for 16 golfers, six of which were seniors and only had a semester left in their entire college career. And that was tough. It was tough. Um, so that was my first head coaching job, and actually I thought it was going to be my last. Um, and then, like I said, you know, I could, I could go on and on about how I got here. It was one thing after another. It was miracle after miracle, to be honest with you. But the bottom line is this. It, you cannot get to where your eyes are set without a good backing. I had great parents. I had a great family. I have a great wife. Matter of fact, if you see a guy and gal walking two beagles around campus right now, it's my, me and my wife because we're still living on campus because we still are homeless <laughs> for now. Because um, as anybody knows, the housing market in Greenville County, South Carolina is nuts. It's crazy right now. You can try to buy a house when you look at something online at 8 a.m. It's sold by noon a lot of times. So anyway, we're actually building a house and. Um, and Greer, and uh, we'll get to move in next week. They said the day before Thanksgiving, so thank goodness uh, we'll, we'll actually have a home by Thanksgiving. But anyway, you can't you can't get to um, be successful in life without uh, a, a good backing. Um, I have a son who's been in the Air Force for four years. He's in South Korea right now, serving our country. And you know, you, you take people like that and you learn from them. Yes, he's my son, and I actually raised him. <laughs> But in a way, by watching what he does and what he does now and how he holds himself and what he's learned, I'm learning from him. You know, he, he's actually leading by example. And that's, 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 that's wonderful for me to you know, kind of be proud of, of that fact. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, through him growing up, I got to coach his little Pee Wee football team, his basketball team, his little league team. So I took things that I was learning while I was coaching golf, implemented it into you know, stuff with him, and that way I got to spend time with him and his buddies and so forth. But anyway, that's kind of like my, my coaching career to date. So I've been coaching golf actually as a head coach for this is my 12th year um, in, in, in D2. As far as coaching philosophies go, I always start my players out with the same thing. Okay, I tell them faith, family, academics and golf faith family academics and golf that is the order and that is what I expect my players to take on as their life philosophy during their time at now NGU you got to keep your priorities in line every day of your life when you wake up if you realize I'm gonna keep faith first family right up there right my education and whatever your sport may be or whatever makes you happy is what I've been telling my phys ed class. Whatever that fourth thing is, whatever it is that makes you, maybe it's kayaking, maybe it's tennis, maybe it's whatever it is that keeps you happy, healthy, in line, you know, with, uh, with, with life. Um, but practice what you preach. Align those priorities with your students. If you expect them to live that, you live it. As the coach, they're going to look at you. If you don't want your players going out and partying and drinking, doing drugs, living it up, don't do it yourself, right? Don't, don't do the things that you don't want your players to do. Live by example. Mentor them the correct way. Nothing upsets me more than to see coaches 
yelling at players or doing things, you know, to try to punish them for doing certain things. And then you look at them behind the scenes and they're living this life themselves. That's not right. Always make sure <clears throat> your co coaching philosophies align with your own life if you expect somebody else to live it. Make sure everybody is together on the same page. Um, the old acronym TEAM, T-E-A-M, together everyone achieves more, so true. Okay? It, you have to have everybody on the same page. You have to have everybody shooting for the same goals. You have to have everybody in sync and in rhythm, okay? And like I said, if the coach is out here doing this and telling you to do that, that is completely out of sync. You don't have the same flow going. Live by faith, live by example. Work with and not against your teams, okay? Or your students or whoever you're trying to mentor. Work with and not against. What does that mean? Well, I explain everything to them as I delegate things. I'm not a person that loves to just delegate or tell somebody, you gotta do this and then walk away. Why am I, am I doing this? You know, I, I said that I learned from my son. I learned from my son from the day he was born because being a parent is completely different. You know, all of a sudden, wow, I am responsible for a life. <clears throat> and I remember my son coming home from school and I was actually one of his teachers when he said this to me. I was actually his like third period teacher. I taught history. He came home and he said, Dad, why do I have to know this stuff? <laughs> What, what is the, I'm not going to use this in my life. And it dawned on me, as I teach and as I coach, really the kids have no idea what direction I'm going unless I let them know what direction we're going in. If I give them a drill and walk away and think they're going to do that drill, what are they thinking? Why am I doing this? This is so stupid. This is just repetitiveness. And I, I'm never... I'm never in this situation. I don't use this. Why do I need this? Whatever, right? I actually took what he said to heart, and I used that the rest of my coaching career, which has helped me tremendously. For example, first day of practice, especially for freshmen, I always gather them around the practice screen. And I tell them, right here, this practice screen is where half of your shots on the golf course come from. It's not with a driver. It's not with an iron on the driving range, it's right here. If you shoot a 72, 36 of those strokes are coming from right around this screen. So why spend two hours over there and none over here? Okay. So that's explaining them. And then I say, look, here's how we're gonna practice from now on. We are going to start from the hole backwards. So what I want you to do is I want you to put your putter in the hole, come out one putter length, and I want you to hit 20 putts. Okay, and you're gonna, you're gonna make 20 putts before you go another putter length back, okay? And, and I sit there and I explain to them every step of the way, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Why is it important? That way there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. There's no, I can't believe I'm out here doing this for no reason. Coach is insane, he's making me do a drill that I'll never, never use, I'm never in this situation. Okay, so that's just an example of, of, of my management style. <clears throat> kind of takes me to um, growth in coaching. So, you know, I mentioned, you know, that, that's one of the things by my son saying that I kind of grew in the way I coached, the way I mentored my players. In life itself, if you're not learning and growing, you're not living. Just remember that. If you're not learning and growing in your life, you're not living. Okay? And when you apply it to coaching or athletics, if you're not living and growing in what you're doing, then you are not gaining on anybody ahead of you, and you're losing ground to the people behind you. Period. And, you know... There's a book that I read many years ago by Larry Bird. I uh, hope you guys know who Larry Bird is. I hope, <laughs> hope I'm not so old. <laughs> all right, Larry Bird. All right, it was called Drive. All right, he knew that he came from a really tiny town. I mean, smaller than Tigerville. 
okay, in Indiana called French Lick, Indiana. He, he even said himself, I'm an ugly, poor, farming white boy. I have no reason to be playing basketball at all. Okay? But when he got up in the morning, he knew, I, I, I kind of got this from Larry, but he never said this, the faith, family, academics, and golf. But he said, if I wasn't in church, if I wasn't doing chores or in the classroom, I was practicing basketball. He had an old rim without even a net on it on the side of a barn, and he would go out there and shoot thousands of shots, thousands of shots from every angle. Okay? And he learned, you know, basically how to control his body and do things that nobody else during that period of time was really doing. And he could make shots that nobody else was making. And he said in the book, I would practice for three, four hours which was more probably than anybody was doing anyway. But when I started to stop practice, I thought to myself, there's somebody out there somewhere practicing right now trying to get better than I am. So I kept practicing. <laughs> That's craziness to some. But he knew if he wasn't you know, growing and learning and working at it, he was not gaining on those in front of him and he was losing ground to those behind him so when it comes to professional development I mentioned you know Larry Bird's book reading is a great way to 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 learn okay we all know that right I mean the first thing you do is read textbook read get online you read stuff <clears throat> but there's a lot of great books that I have my players read that I still have I mean I've probably read them 20 times each, myself or more. Um, Lou Holtz, the, the, the uh, coach, I don't know if you know the football coach, Lou Holtz. He actually coached at South Carolina for a few years, also won a uh, national championship at Notre Dame. Lou Holtz wrote a book called Winning Every Day. And kind of along the lines of what Larry Bird was saying, he goes, you know, I'm five foot nothing. I'm a hundred and nothing. I look like a leprechaun. I have a lisp. How in the world is somebody like me going to tell a 340 pound lineman what to do and have them listen to me? He said, through respect. That's how. They respect what I have to say. Can I go out there and block? No. Can I run a 40 yard dash in under 10 seconds? <laughs> he said, no. But they respect me because of where I come from and how I live my life and what I know and the knowledge I share with them. Okay? Very interesting book. It's called Winning Every Day. Um, when it comes to golf, you have Harvey Pinnock, who has long passed away, but his books will forever be ingrained in golf history. He, he has books called The Little Red Book, The Little Green Book, for those who love the game. I have my players read that. As far as psychology goes, you can always find sports psychology books. Um, I always say be careful which ones you read and so forth, but there's a great sports psychologist named Bob Rotella who was big into um, golf. I mean, that's kind of where he got his sports psychology start. Bob Rotella wrote a lot of books. He put, uh, I actually have, instead of the books, I listen to his audio tapes because they're actually even better hearing it straight from him. If you don't know exactly who Bob Rotella is, if you like college basketball, he is the number one guy for John Calipari, who is um, the head coach for the University of Kentucky. He does all the sports psychology at the University of Kentucky now basketball. He's good friends with Coach, coach Cal um, <clears throat> and goes and, and talks with them and, and, um, and helps Coach Cal out with uh, their sports psych. So professional development includes things like reading, um, <clears throat> you know, things that I have to do on a regular basis is uh, uh, I take a USGA um, class every year on the rules of golf because every year they seem to change. They do something kind of out of the ordinary or crazy every year. I don't know why they do that. To me, um, one of the biggest things that I think anybody ever got away with was the USGA. Talk about changing the rules. For years, you couldn't use any kind of a yardage um, like rangefinder, okay? And the USGA said, without telling the public, we're gonna change the rules 
in two years, we're going to let the um, rangefinders be legal. What do you think the USDA did? They went out and bought stock in Bushnell, Nikon, all rangefinder companies. Two years later, they released that we're, we're going to make it legal. What do you think every golfer in the world did? Bought a rangefinder. It's now legal. You can't find an NCAA golfer without a rangefinder. <clears throat> they sold hundreds of thousands of rangefinders, you know, and, and, and yeah, that was a slick move. I don't know how they got away with that because that's about as illegal as me going down to the drugstore and holding it up. <laughs> but, but there you go. Craziness. Um, totally got away with that. But anyway, taking USGA yearly classes. I actually have my student athletes if there's a local one. Um, so like if maybe Cherokee Valley or something will host one, I'll have my players actually go also so that they can ask questions and, and get to know what the new rules changes are and so forth. Um, golf is a little different, um, you know, than, than most sports and basketball, football. I mean, you get a flag, they'll explain to you what you've done wrong and go on about the business. And in golf, if you don't get flagged, you get disqualified. <laughs> There's a big, you know what I mean? Like, it's a big difference. If you accidentally break a rule, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, you're gone. Okay, so a lot of pressure there for, for knowing the rules and so forth. Um, coaching camps, coaching clinics, things of that nature, always be looking out for those things in your particular sports. Um, you know, and you don't have to be in your particular sport. I'll tell you what, one of the best coaching camps you could actually go to um, years ago was ran by Dean Smith, North Carolina's basketball coach. You, he taught all kinds of things at his coaching clinic. Um, had some to do with basketball, but most of it was about being a good mentor, somebody that people can look up to, what you can do to get people's attention, you know, how to talk to people, how to reach out to your players. You know, one of the big things that that he and Coach K at Duke was known for, even though they were huge rivals, was they graduated their players. That was a big thing. <clears throat> a lot of coaches can't say that they graduate a very large percentage of their players, but they, they both did. Okay, And then the use of technology. We have a tool now that I didn't have when I was in college. I know I don't look ancient, but I'm on the cusp of being pretty ancient. Okay, I didn't have a phone, I didn't have one of these when I was in college, okay? They actually had just come out with flip phones, but I thought they were completely stupid because you flip it open and just even text somebody, if you wanted one letter, or like you'd have to hit the number one like three times to get the C, and you have, I mean, it took you forever. I was like, why not just call the dude up and say, hey, this one's still taking 20 minutes to text. But you guys have this, this is a mini computer. It would take me a thousand different devices to buy, okay, 20 years ago that's in this thing now. Everything from an alarm clock to, you know, a computer to whatever, right? But anyway, you can Google stuff. You know, you, you have everything at your fingertips now to use technology to look things up, to look for coaches' clinics, to look for ways to in, improve your professional development in your sport or as a coach or whatever. So always take advantage of that stuff. Always be looking because just remember, if you're not living or you're not learning and, and growing, you're not living and that goes in coaching as well. So <clears throat> I think as far as like the, the little bit of questions that you wanted me to cover, I think that just about covers that. So where do you see yourself going to uh, project your coaching career in the next 10 or 15 years? Um, I want to win several national championships right here. This is, this is a place that I, I know I can do it at. And the reason why I say that is it has very little to do with me. I'm just going to be honest. I think that North Greenville offers something that most schools don't. And when you come here and you actually are part of the environment and you start looking around and so forth, it's a special place. And if you sell that as a special place to people, to the right people, you'll get the right people here and, and, and good things will happen. I mean, look at the baseball team, right? 
I mean, that, that can happen to any sport here. It can happen easily in football. It can happen easily in basketball. And I've noticed that recruiting here, that I, I mean, I had to work at OBU. It was such a small school, nobody knew it. You know, I, if I got a hold of 100 golfers, I would get 10 to visit, and I would sign two of them. And I'd have to work really hard at it. I get four or five emails, texts, or calls per day to people I haven't even reached out at ever. I have no idea who they are, and I get them every day. Um, which blows my mind that I'm at a place that, you know, kids already know is special. They want to come here. Our facilities, phenomenal. What, you know, Cherokee Valley is a good, it's a good golf course. It's a, it's a, it's a great golf course, and it's got good people at it. But the practice facilities that NGU has at that golf course are as good as any D1 that I've ever seen. I mean, they, we've got um, bays. Actually, th if you took this room and put two rooms this size beside each other, there's, um, there's a garage door that goes up in the front of it, out to the driving range, and this whole thing is AstroTurf. And we, you can, it can be raining, it can be snowing, it can be cold, hot, whatever, you can go in there, there's an air conditioner, there's a heater, there's a fan. You can hit balls in practice whenever you want. <clears throat> and not only is it um, AstroTurf, but there's holes cut out in it, so you can practice with putting in there too if you want. It's crazy. Um, and then, you know, the short range and, and um, the ability to play whenever we want, basically, over there, because the deal they have with the school. I mean, it's a great setup. And, and kids are calling and don't even know about that yet. They're just calling because of the school. Coach, I want to go to a a good D2 school, but I want a Christian environment. My parents want me to be in a good, safe place. NGU seems to be the fit. Then you bring them over. Oh, I love the campus. Then you take them over there, and they're like, oh, my goodness. You just you just sold me. You know, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I could see staying here for a long time, especially since I'm just going to have a brand new mortgage. <laughs> One other question. So if, if recruiting is uh, a little bit easier, and you're going to be flooded with students, what criteria, what are you looking for when you select? I can, gonna, I, mean, I can be, I can afford to be a little bit more picky. You know, how are you going to, what, what are you looking at there? Right. I can afford to be a little bit more picky, first of all. Selective. Yeah. So, since I was brought in a week before the season, okay, and I started getting all these emails and stuff, because of where I came from, I thought, boy, I better jump on this. So I made some offers and, and whatnot. And um, I already had 10 men golfers and six women golfers coming in next year. We had to cut it off. We were like, coach, you're getting too many players. So I had to learn from that, first of all. Um, going forward, like next year, what I would really like to do is, before, before even thinking about making an offer, I want to bring in each one. I want to meet them, meet their families. I want to see if my coaching philosophy, the faith, family, academics, and golf align with what they uh, have in their life. Um, I can make a better golfer, you know, just like Landon can make better baseball players and so forth. I mean, we have great coaches here. They can make, you know, you, you want a good athlete. You want somebody that you can work with. Okay, yes, that's true. But, you know, I, I, I have an easier time making a better golfer than I do a better person, if that makes sense. Now I can mentor them and I can, I can lead, lead by example and I can pray with them and I can do all. But ultimately, that's, that's, that's their decision, okay? Um, so if you bring in somebody that's a Christian that is a good person, has good, you know, family life, good philosophies of their own and so forth, it'll make for a better team environment. And that goes a long way. I've seen teams that absolutely implode because they can't get along, they fight. You know, you, you don't want that. So, you know, I'm just going to be more picky about the type of person that I bring in, more, more so than even the player. So we don't get many coaches that come in that coach both teams. Do, do you coach the two teams differently? And if so, can you describe how you approach them? You kind of have to, you kind of have to be careful with that, because you don't want to be seen as favoritism one way or favoritism the other. You can't be harder on the guys just because they're guys than the girls. 
Um, I, I set numbers that they have to reach. Uh, it was kind of funny. Um, the girls actually just completely blew out expectations right off the bat. They broke three school records in the first two terms. And um, the guys were struggling at first. So the way I say is, look, if we don't shoot a total of 300, okay, if you shoot 305, that means you owe me five circuits. Well, what's a circuit, Coach? You don't want to know, but if you shoot 305, you're going to know what 500 feels like, right? And the girls was 325, okay, because there is, there is a difference in the average of how they shoot. So, so anyway, when the guys came home from one of the tournaments and they had shot 10 over, they owed me 10 circuits, okay? And uh, so we got back to the golf course and all the girls on the girls team just like, hey, what, what's these circuits? I'm like, you, you can sit around all, can we watch, can we, can we watch? I said, yeah, you can watch, but I said, just remember, what you're seeing here can also be you guys at some time. And so anyway, what we do is we play 10 and 11, okay, at, at Cherokee Valley. And for every birdie they make on 10 and 11, it takes one off. They have an opportunity to make up, you know, what I call forgiveness, right? So after number 11, there is a huge straight up the mountain hike to number 12 tee. Okay, so they all put down their golf bags after number 11, however many they owe me. Say they owe, they owe seven, okay? <clears throat> so they run up to the 12 tee box, they get in a quick circle, they do seven sit-ups, seven push-ups, seven jumping jacks, run back down, that's one, okay? Then they run back up, seven, 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 run back down, that's two. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so basically it's, it's, it's punishment, but it also shows them the importance of just one stroke. Can you imagine having to do that one more time plus one of everything? You know, if you would have just shot one, one stroke better, you'd be done right now, but you got one more. You know, concentrate on every shot, everything matters. You know, that, that, kind, of, that kind of thing. So <clears throat> anyway, I, I would do that for the girls too. The girls would have to do it as well. Um, now, as far as like coaching uh, in person, the only difference I know, I've noticed after 12 years is that if I go and I'm talking over a shot with a girl, the girl is usually like, mm -hmm. The guy is more like, well, I don't know, maybe I need to hit this, and that, you know, that's happening, and when, and I, they are more like, they'll question a lot more than, than the girls will. The girls are like, I, I'm with you, coach, all right, let's do this, you know, and the guys are like, well, I don't know, the wind feels like it's kind of in my face, and it's a little bit, so yeah, I mean, it, you, you'll get that. Now, does it cause me to coach differently? Not, not per se, but it's just getting around little things like that is the difference between the guys and the girls. So, but I don't, I don't really see coaching differently in, in, in the way that you're talking. Golf's golf. <laughs> they may not hit it as far, but the girls have a better short game, I will say. <laughs> Which goes a long way. I like that short short. I don't purposely wore a Notre Dame sweatshirt all the last week. <laughs> Being a Gamecock fan. I, I went to a Notre Dame football game a few years ago and I thought while I was there, heck, I'll buy, I'll buy a sweatshirt, you know, something with Notre Dame football on it. Hardly ever wear it. We got a lot of Clemson fans in the, around me, so I was just rocking the Notre Dame football. <laughs> What else? Well, I'm curious, your game has a lot of technology. Uh, it's constant developments in clubs. Thousands of clubs out there, shoes mm -hmm. and balls. How do you keep up so that you can best educate and train your students? We have a track man system, they call it, where like you can hook it up to an iPad and you know use the camera on the iPad and all the laser technology and all that stuff. So that's, that's one thing. But um, several years ago, I, um, I went to a, uh, because I owned a pro shop at the golf course we were at. I went to a um, Titleist convention that they were holding up in Pittsburgh and they were inviting all the pros um, to come up and like sit in on this uh, Q&A session. And one of the guys asked, hey, you know, is that any driver that's coming out, you know, you guys are advertising that it's five to 10 yards further, you know, than, is that true? Is that really like true? And the guy laughed and he says, let me, let me tell you something. He says, um, 
How many times have you been told that this new driver is going to make you hit it five yards further? And the guy says, well, every year. He says, shouldn't you be hitting it 410 yards? He's like, yeah, you're right. He said, well, here's the thing. They designed things, especially like drivers, to break down over time. After so many hits, the face starts to kind of lose its balance a little bit at a time. Not enough to where you would really recognize it, but enough to where after hitting it for a year, if you put it next to a brand new one, it's going to be 5, 10, 15 yards difference. And you're going to think to yourself, man, I'm hitting it 5, 10 yards further. He said, I forget what he, he, he called that. It was um, He had a word for it. But anyway, it was something. Um, they, they, it was something that they started with the appliances and stuff in the '60s. Um, companies where it would break down on purpose. That's basically what it is. And uh, so that's the way they end up designing clubs. So I tell my kids, you know, they ask, "Should I get new stuff?" And I'm gonna be like, "Yeah, but it has nothing to do with you. Believe it or not, you you do need to keep up with technology. But a lot of times." It's not that big of a difference in the tech from the year before. It only looks like it because it kind of trips. But golf, like you said, golf is one of those sports. I mean, a football doesn't change too much. You know, a, a basketball doesn't change too much. Baseball is pretty much the same for the last several decades. But, you know, even the golf balls have changed dramatically. Uh, you know, it used to be you'd only get two, three holes out of a golf ball. And they'd be all chewed up and you know, basically have to get out of the one and throw it away and whatnot. Um, now, I mean, I, I play three, four rounds with a golf, with the same golf ball, you know, which is amazing. But, um, you know, you have to be careful with the technologies, all, all I'm saying. You know, you don't want to like over, overdo it or make a kid overthink because the last thing you need to do is have one of your players overthinking something, thinking, man, it's me, I'm not. No, it's not. Your swing looks good. Everything's good. You just have an old driver. <laughs> so. What about the uh, students come in and some of them got private swing coaches they've worked with? How do you merge a student that has their own private swing coach versus you as an outfielder to become their team coach? It, I am not. A swing coach. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a college golf coach because, and the reason why I say that, and I tell parents this, and I tell the kids this, can I overhaul your swing? Can I, you know, do things differently with you? Can I change it? Can I help you? Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. But when you show up to school, and we're not allowed to start practice until the week after classes begin, okay, we, we get one and a half weeks before our first tournament. Is that the time to be changing your swing? No, you got you got to bring with what you're, you know, you got to go with what you bring to campus. Um, I am a tweaker. I get to know every one of my kids' swings, and I watch them, and then that way I know when stuff something starts to go awry, I can be like, hey, you know, you're getting kind of like underneath this, or you're coming over the top, or you're, you know, I, I tweak. I just tell them, you know, hey. Usually you have the ball here in your stance and you got it back here. That's why you're hitting it that way. So um, I, I, I'm, I do nothing different than what their swing coaches do. Matter of fact, I even sometimes get their swing coaches numbers. And if something starts going wrong, hey, so-and-so is doing this. You know, has that happened to them before? If so, what do you want? Because I don't want to, like, you know, blow up everything. You know, I want everything to kind of be going in the right direction. So when they show up, they got to be ready to play. Yes. Yeah. Not let's work on your game and be ready in four months. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now the drills and stuff that'll help them. You know, like the putting drills and the chipping drills I give them and, and things of that nature. But again, that's all tweaking. That's not overhauling or changing anything. And and I hope that they work out year round. And I, I use hope very loosely because I know. I know a lot of my guys don't see a weight room or a, or a training room for nine months out of the year until they get here. Um, but uh, we also do, we work with our you know, strength and conditioning coaches and stuff here. Um, we try to give them workouts. Uh, after they get here, we'll give them a workout, say like, you know, keep things consistent. 
We want lean muscle. We don't want bulky muscle. Um, we want you conditioned. You know, we don't want you working on just lifting. We want you more or less working on um, making sure you can walk nine miles because with 14 pounds on your back or more, you know, because that's what you got to do. Sometimes longer than that. We play a 36 hole tournament sometimes in one day. It's a lot of walking. Any of you guys have questions? You guys are easy. <laughs> You've already been trained well, I can see. That's what, that's what it is. Well, Coach, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. It means yeah. a lot. And welcome to North Greenville. Thank you. We know you're having a great experience here. Appreciate you all. This yeah. has been pretty awesome. It's been a great three months already. But I'll be honest, I can't wait to get off campus. <laughs> I forgot what it was like we're, to be a college really student. Where stay at the cabins? Actually, um, right down here in a little apartment uh, dorm between Howard and uh, nobody had been in it in two and a half years, so you can imagine the shape it was in. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody be working on your interview paper. Make sure you're ready to turn that in and present that in a week and a half.